The um, classic science fiction movies, love them, hate them? Why, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle? I'm going to go uh, a um, blanket, love them, because they are our foundation. They are what got us to this point. <coughs> Charlie, amplify? Or? Uh, okay. Um, there is this nasty rumor that's been going around that I love bad movies. It's just, it's just not the case. I just see good qualities in movies that other people overlook. Movies that are really bad, I, I don't want to deal with. Um, one of our members, Greg Kadulian, is always after me to run the most awful crap from the 50s. The stuff, stuff that I would rather run the giant Gila monster or the killer shrews because they're fun. But... Giant from the Unknown, where uh, the, the the uncle of the guy who was Jethro in the Beverly Hillbillies plays a resurrected conquistador who sort of stumbles around the landscape until he dies. Uh, it was not a terribly fun movie and was boring. In the 50s and 60s, the, the classic science fiction movie period, there had been science fiction movies before, but up until about 1950, People that made movies did not distinguish among horror, fantasy, and science fiction. They just kind of randomly mixed the elements together. The, the classic example is Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. When Kurt Siodmak, the, the writer, was asked to write a story about those two characters meeting, he said, but one is science fiction and one is fantasy. How am I supposed to resolve this? And he said, by writing it. He went, all right collected his paycheck and wrote the story and just kind of ignored it. In the 50s, the emphasis was heavily on science fiction, and a lot of people understood that that meant there had to be some kind of science involved. They didn't understand necessarily what science meant, but they knew that it required machines or drugs or technology of some kind. And all of these films at least give us the science fictional basis. We have, we do, uh, in the, the Killer Shrews, um, science has manipulated the genetic makeup of tiny little animals to make them big, the size of large dogs, which makes it very easy for dogs to portray them, yep. uh, but somehow manages to keep their metabolism at true level so that they are huge, ravenous creatures instead of being large, docile things, like something that size would normally be. A movie called Creation of the Humanoids is all about how there aren't people anymore. There are only androids. They are things that are like robots, but they all have self-will. To all intents and purposes, they're people, except that they are mechanical people. And the plot of the movie is a renegade scientist who is one of the last human beings <coughs> left trying to manipulate the mechanical people to make them human beings. When he succeeds in this, of course, he's killed. Because you wouldn't want that to go on. <laughs> At the end of the film, a boy and girl who are now human beings, instead of now, they're no longer robots, they're now human beings, uh, are going to go off and live happily ever after. Whereupon, the robot version of the guy who invented all this stuff turns to the camera and says, it must have worked because, after all, you're here, aren't you? <laughs> so there's a wide swath of, of science in these science fiction movies. And to a certain extent, it depends on how good a grasp of science the creators of the film had as to whether the science is good. Whether the story is good is just anybody's guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, part of it is that most of us grew up watching the, these old movies. And certainly at the time that I was growing up, that was the only game in town. And I think <coughs> Mel Gilden is the one who said the golden age of science fiction is 12. Yeah. Whatever was around when you were 12, that's the best stuff in the world, <laughs> and everything else is either derivative or newfangled, and I don't mm -hmm. understand it. <laughs> Michelle, any comments? Sure. I agree with you. That was what was around. The term sci-fi is a treasure term for me. 
if on TV it meant it was what was watchable. <laughs> Arlene. Well, there's things like the the Attack of the Killer Tomato, which is a cult classic. Well, what makes it what makes it a cult classic? And there's others out there that are cult classics, where uh, it's so cheesy that you can't help but want to watch it. It's just I like an like accident; you can't now. take your eyes off of. <laughs> That kind of film, which is pretty much the kind of film that I avoid except to know enough about them to comment on them, uh, they are either done ineptly by people who don't know what they're doing, or they are done deliberately, stupidly by people who do, if they succeed in hitting the right balance between following the rules of the genre and spoofing it, they can produce something that achieves that cult status. The One lost, of the, hmm? the Lost Skeleton of Cadaver. Oh yes, The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver is absolutely delightful. It is just, it is so wonderful. I, just, <laughs> I, I almost wanted to see it twice in the same year, breaking my cardinal rule for movies. It is just so carefully inept <laughs> and thin-witted and cloth-eared and and yet it is so much fun to watch. Um, um, some movies get cult status because people don't see them. The Blob from the 50s attained a certain amount of cult status because of what people said about it and because of its theme song. It has a wonderful theme song that just describes what the Blob does and in fact there is a Halloween carol of it that just takes the theme music and repeats the, the, uh, the um, lyrics a couple of extra times. Uh, people don't see the movie, and if they do, they don't really pay attention to it. The Blob is actually it's a very well-crafted movie that follows dramatic construction. It has a dramatic unity to it. Everything in the story follows logically from what preceded it. It all centers around that creature and it all takes place in one night. But because it has Steve McQueen in it, and because of the song, because of what people say, it's a cult film that most people haven't seen. Well, just, I'm sorry, I have another yeah. question. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, of course I do, I have loads of questions. Well, let's, let's move into the 20, 20th century and talk about uh, Mars Attacks, which was a spoof on all these old movies. I loved it, because I grew up on all those old movies. Um, do you think that that was an accurate depiction of some of those B-movie, B-sci-fi movies that were out in those days, in the 50s and 60s? Not really. I think it, I think it is an idealization of people's memories of what those were like. As such, people who have a good idea of what they were like don't like the movie. Uh, people who have that same view love it a lot. I happen to like it, even though I don't think it quite represents it. I like it's a very color and. Slim whip. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> well, with that, uh, we'll move on to the next topic.